Good morning, Walara Church. Happy Sabbath. Today's scripture reading is Psalm chapter 50, verse 15. Call upon me in the day of the trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. Amen. Good morning, everybody. It's uh, wonderful to be able to meet with you today. It's my first time on a Zoom meeting. So I hope that uh, God's spirit will reach through the, the airwaves as the angels in heaven were flying through the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel. And I pray dear Lord that today that the gospel may be the preeminent theme of my talk. We'll just have a word of prayer. We thank you very much, Heavenly Father, for the opportunity to preach. And we thank you, dear Lord, that you have done wonderful things in the lives of many people in this community of Wallara and elsewhere. We've heard some wonderful things today that really thrilled my heart about your interest and care for other people. So bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the most interesting characters um, that I was attracted to in many ways was the writings of a, a man called Daniel Defoe. To give himself an aristocratic name, he put the D before the foe. So his name was really Daniel Foe. And the moment he did that, his life sort of changed. He had a very colorful life back in the 1700s. And he wrote the famous Robinson Crusoe. And in the main character of which is, you know, Robinson, he sees a man that is shipwrecked on a, in an island in the middle of the Pacific or the, the Americas, more towards uh, Central America. And there, after catching many bouts of fever and um, exposure on, on, on the land, he realized uh, instinctively that he was getting close to dying. So he managed to muster up just enough energy to reach out to his little box that floated ashore. And he knew that in there, there was a Bible. Now he was a, he was a, a man that uh, had occasional uh, sort of contact with religious people. And, and he has his character realizing that when you get into such a mess that he was in, the life of a sailor, everybody knows. The ups and downs, the profligacy, <clears throat> the drunkenness, all those things. So here we have the character, Robinson, just reaching out with perhaps minutes to live. And he said, God, can you give me a word whether I'm going to make it or not? And then he reaches out and his listless fingers fell upon Psalm chapter 50, verse 15, and the boys read this very well. Call upon me in the day of trouble. And what did he say after that? I will deliver you and you will honor me. And that's basically where the story takes the big turn. From that moment on, hope sprung in his heart. Last week, I was talking about from sadness to gladness into darkness. And it was the story of my youth and my early childhood. I wanted to do part two. Now, part two parallels part one. So we're going to go back to the beginning again. And we have two parallel stories moving towards the center. When my earliest memory, was when I was 10 months old, very vivid early memory. In that moment, I sensed in my deepest being that I was being dragged away from a presence that I had grown to love. 
and that was the presence of my mother. And my mother, for her own reasons, had to abandon me. And I ended up in a little orphanage in Rathdrum, County Wicklow, in Ireland. A lovely little place, very quiet. It was a nunnery. So this is where ladies and Catholic girls and girls from other parts of the world uh, would come and devote their lives to the cloister style of, of existence. Praying, chanting, singing, sleeping, eating, just that sort of thing. But because it also was a nunnery, they decided to upkeep the nunnery by, by taking orphans into this little place. And the government would give so much money, of Ireland would give so much money to, um, to, to sustain the children. This is how they made their, their living. They got the cream of the top of what the government would sort of give us. So in this orphanage, I began my life. And I vividly remember all the boys around me in their various cots. I remember uh, looking at the cots. I can remember the toys that were hanging off, the strings that went over my blue cot. And I remember interacting with the nuns. Um, right now, I see them again, just interacting with me. And um, this is where my childhood really began. One day when I was about four, three and a half, four, I was chasing a ball. And the moment I was focused on the ball, I determined to get the ball before it ran out onto the road. But it bounced and then unaware of traffic and roads. And, and it was only one van that could have hit me. And it was the bread van that used to come up every day up the, the driveway of the nunnery, around a little S-bend, and then on, on the S-bend, I ran out. And I heard screams from about three or four nuns and some of the other children. And I found myself right in front of a red van that was seconds from running into me. And I was startled by this with absolutely no fear. A calmness came into my body and I felt a hand behind my back, a hand somewhere up near my mouth, and I was slapped down on the tarmac and I felt the tarmac sponging as if I was on a, a cushion. And then the bread van just kept going, screeching, and when, when it went over me, I noticed all the, the little compartments and the, the, the exhaust pipes and all the little bits and pieces that you'd see when you were looking up. And then I stood up. And I was told later that uh, I'd nearly got killed. And to me, you know, I wasn't quite sure what that meant. But I felt the presence of a being very clearly that had his eyes on me. And so from that moment on, I had this sense that there was an angel that we found out later that looks after children. Many of the illustrations in the convent were of angels guarding little children on bridges or roadways at sea. And uh, so I had a deep sort of understanding and I wanted to know more about these angels and how they operate in the world. So life goes on, and I spent probably um, the next few years um, just learning uh, the, the Irish language, uh, learning about the Catholic Church. Um, I was virtually totally involved in all things Catholic. And I'm, I would say now that amongst all my peers, I was probably more devout than all of them. And I really took my Catholic faith very deeply into my, into my life. I was constantly doing my rosaries. I was constantly praying. I was constantly thinking about the things of God. 
I would flick through beautiful pictures and illustrations of the life of Christ. And, uh, and I was always about spiritual literature. And, and it was such a blessing to me. And I believed everything the church told me. In my childhood, there was many sad moments, lots of sad moments. Uh, one moment in particular that stands out was when another orphan came. He was about seven years old and he came to the orphanage and I heard this weeping all through the night. And I remember that the child came in to the orphanage about two o'clock in the morning. And from the moment he came in, he was just crying. So I just couldn't sleep. So I thought, well, I better go over and see if he's okay. And as I lifted his sheet, the sight that I saw when I lifted the sheet of this weeping um, wretch of humanity, I saw a boy that was totally disfigured. There wasn't a single part of his face or body that wasn't contoured and ripped and torn into awful scars. I've never to this day seen anyone with such disfigurement. And in the end, it was so much for me that I just sort of wept, just, just wept. I didn't know how to, to, to understand what, how do you react in something like this. So, but I felt a peace that came into me and all I could say to him is that I'll be your friend while you are here in this orphanage. And that meant so much to him. And if eyes could talk, his eyes could talk. If, um, if there was music that could play, his the music seemed to come from his eyes. God has given, given him an amazing gift of just his eyes said everything because his flesh was just mangled. And a little later on, that, that boy, a little later on, eventually left the school because some people who came into the orphanage saw him and felt that this wasn't a place for him. He needed privacy, he needed care, and some wealthy local farmers came in and took him and, and, and adopted him into their homes and gave him that privacy that such a disfigurement, you know, wouldn't be such a, a torturous life in a life uh, of care. So. The, the most dramatic thing, apart from the vision that I mentioned last week, was when the orphanage um, erupted in flames one night. Now, I was in the, if you look at a rectangular shape, I was at the furthest end next to the window, about 20 meters away towards the steps. It was a wooden steps that walked and bent in a circle up to the top. And on the top, you, you went on to the sort of the, the, the garden area. So it was downstairs and the windows overlooked the mountains and the hills of Ireland. And one night I heard all this screaming and uh, shouting and uh, all sorts of things. And, and so thinking I was in a dream, I sat on my bed, just sitting down, and I looked at the scene before me and I thought, I'm having a dream. And I noticed that the, 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 the floor was on fire, red flames engulfing, like a, so almost like a creature that was in the room. And then I noticed the walls catch on fire. Then I noticed that the whole ceiling was on fire and the belching smoke uh, was really gathering more white than black at, at that moment. And then I felt awful pressure of flames coming towards me and I knew I was trapped. And then I discovered that I must, this must not be a dream, this must be reality. And I thought, oh, what do I do? And then just then, the moment I bowed my head and said, what do I do? That this being, of dazzling brightness and it was just wonderful. He just walked through the flames and I was completely mesmerized by this very tall being that I know to be an angel coming towards me very softly, gently, without any fear, long, lovely, silvery hair 
Uh, his eyes just magnificent. Uh, the smile was benign and very calm. And I looked at him and I said, who are you? Are you the fireman? And he says, no, I am here to rescue you. And he said, just be calm. I will take you through the flames. No flame will hurt you. Nothing will get you when you're in my arms. So he picked me up in a fireman's lift and he asked me just to look at his eyes. So when I looked at his eyes, I knew then it wasn't human eyes. There was just something of a superior nature to his eyes. Um, just couldn't quite figure it out, but I kept looking at his eyes. But as we walked towards the stairs, I noticed that the stairs had completely disappeared in the flames. I now also heard the fire brigade going on in the distance on the outside. I heard people screaming like, Seamus is still in there. Because when they counted all the other orphans, I was the only one missing. So when I looked, I said to the angel, or this being, the stairs are not there. So how can you take me up? And he said, just believe. And then I just believed. And as he approached the stairs, he walked up these invisible stairs, just step by step by step, in like just invisible stairs that were there to him. And then when he got to the top, we walked a few meters and I, I thought, I can breathe okay. And, and I don't feel any pain, even though the flames were wrapping around us. And then he put me near the doorway. And then by then the, the smoke was black as. And then he put me near the doorway and he said, Seamus, you are a brand plucked from the fire. And he pushed me so hard that I rolled a few meters forward into the arms or at the feet of two or three firemen who dragged me aside into the little garden and all the other children were watching. And what alarmed all of them, the nuns, the, the firemen, there wasn't one burn, not one hair singed on my body, on my face, on my head, nothing. And I could hear no, uh, sort of nuns saying, it's a miracle. And the fire brigade says, we can't explain that. We couldn't go into the heat. We could not get near this door. And this boy just rolls out uh, onto, our, onto our knees. That was when I discovered that the invisible world is parallel to our world that there are angels and there are beings that are there from God to look after us, to care for us. And a very embarrassing thing happened after that is that because it was such a miracle, I was made a fuss over for quite a while with the nuns and they changed my name, which become annoying to me. Instead of Seamus, they called me St. James the Less after one of the disciples. I was worried because why couldn't I have been James the Greater instead of James the Less? But to shorten the name, the kids kept teasing me. And so I said, just call me Lessie, Lessie. So that was my nickname right up till I was a teenager. And I suppose it's good for my pride because I always sensed that I was the lesser that I'm quite happy to be the lesser of all my friends as well. So life went on. And shortly after that, I, I told you about the dream of the second coming of Christ. I mentioned the, the glorious things that I saw there. And I saw the resurrection morning. And I saw how God will come again. And that just gave me wonderful hope. And, and this was... A quite a dark period. I would say that in my childhood I was mostly sad, but there was fun times. There was times where I was happy, but in my psychology I was, I was very, very preoccupied 
with being alone in this world. Things changed. And one day, I was having a bad day. I was annoyed just with stuff. And uh, so I began to get into a really down mood. And in the down mood, I didn't want to cooperate with anybody. Two people came to the orphanage. Their names were Mr. and Mrs. James Mead. He was a retired judge. And his wife, um, you know, was just wonderful, wonderful lady. He was a wonderful man. Rose, her name was. And uh, Rose Mead. And they lived in a, an address which is memorized in my mind. They made me memorize the address. Seven St. Asim's Rose, West Grahini, Dublin, five. And they came in. Now, these people were ones that on the Sabbath day, which was Sunday in Ireland, they would go out and picnics and wander through the fields and long walks. And that's how they kept the Sabbath in Ireland, mostly in our, in our area. And they came in and said to the, to the authorities, we would like to take one of the children out for the day. And uh, in, in the view that we may wish to foster them or partly adopt them and, and so on. So they lined up all the boys and they said, there's a couple coming here that want to take someone out for the day. And then they counted all the boys and I was the only one missing. I don't know what I ate that morning, but it, whatever it was, it wasn't good for me. So when they called me up in my bad mood, I came up with my Wellingtons, and so much water in Ireland, and, and the Wellingtons, and I had my shirt on, and scruffy, and my hair was all over the place. I used to have hair. And, and then I was embarrassed because while we were standing there, the Meads came in, and they said, look around and um and just choose we leave it to you to fall the impression of the lord and you can choose which one that you'd like but that one over there and they pointed me out i wouldn't pay any attention to that one over there and that was me and at that moment i soiled myself and uh, whatever it was it came right through me and the whole room erupted in groans of such awful stink and uh, they said oh you see what he's done now he's always doing stuff like this and i felt so embarrassed because i wanted someone to just come in and show me some love i wanted to be noticed i wanted to feel that i i mean something i mean something and so at that moment, I looked up at them and they looked at me and I knew they were going to pick me. I don't know how, but when I looked at their eyes, I knew. And they said in front of the nuns, the abbotess, the main abbot, abbotess, that that one, Seamus, the smelly one. Uh, and I knew they were talking about me. So yeah, I was showered up dressed up and I went with these people and they were such a blessing to me. I was surrounded by some beautiful nuns and some of them were kind, not many. Most of them were psychologically wanting. They had their issues because I guess it's in Ireland, you're the, the thought in every good Catholic home that one of the sons must become a Christian brother and one of the daughters should become a nun. And, and I think because of the sheer pressure of cultural Catholicism, many of these young ladies and, 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 and later, later Christian brothers were really there because of the pressure of their families rather than necessarily a calling. So from the, from the, the awful sort of, you know, mess that I was in emotionally, two people that once again, I believe the Lord had sent to me, to rescue me, to show me the, for the first time, I guess in my life, what Christian love was all about. What love is. I watched these people, never said much, but I watched them. And everything they did shone from Christian love. 
And those two people made a huge impression on my life. Sometimes it would be a month away, sometimes six weeks away. But I stayed with these people on and off, even after I left the orphanage when I was 10 years old. I was still visited by them. They still picked me up for weekends. Sometimes it was now ever fortnightly. But what I learned from the Medes that I found two people who were not only deep devout Catholics, but were deep devout Christians. And Christ was using them to mold, soften, and to give me a faith that the gospel is real, that it can change people's lives. I was no angel. I was no angel as a child. I was troublesome. I mentioned the last time I spoke with you guys that the nurse at my birth was so annoyed that it took me so long to come out that when I did come out, I came out feet first. That was my, that was my thing. I did not want to leave my mother's womb. And finally, when this Irish nurse pulled me out of the womb and hung me up stairs, um, upside down, she said, this little bee, whack is going to be trouble and um and she wasn't wrong she wasn't wrong i got to the age of 10 years old and now it was time to go to a higher school the orphanage only take people the nuns only took people till they were 10 years old and so with with me accompanied with some of my other friends uh from that school we went up in a van a bus and by the by the um the police force, it was a police van that would come down, a police driver, a police woman came down and picked us up and took, took us to the, the very famous school in Ireland called the Artane Christian Brother School. It was, a, it was a, a beautifully ran school. It was a magnificent school of about a thousand, a thousand kids at the time at that school. And that's where I ended up. In, in the school. I mentioned before to you that I was allowed to fight for the first week and uh, against all anybody who annoyed me or anybody who called me names or whatever. So I went through the, that, um, that week uh, with full permission to retaliate. Now, I was quite happy to retaliate. And, but after a week, when all the other boys realized that um, I would not stop fighting once you started on me. Uh, they just left me alone. I, I saw in that story that no matter what trouble I got into, I always sensed there was someone, someone there looking after me. Artane was a very tough school. And I mentioned about the knife that was thrown by one of my friends who had a vision, had a trance vision and told me about my whole family and uh, threw a knife at the, at, at the judge. Um, and she was taken off, nearly lost her life. So there was boys like that I was surrounded with, uh, the criminal elements, and though I was not from the criminal element, but to, to qualify for a, uh, you know, what we call an annuity, the, I had to be labeled a criminal from the age of 10 months old that was how the system worked unless you were considered a criminal you couldn't get the annuity of the government to be cared for by the nuns or the christian brothers so it was true we are born we are born into trouble that's just the way this world is we're born into trouble and when we see the text uh, jumping out and the only hope we have is to reach out. We find ourselves that call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you. That text has proved to be such a blessing to me in my life. Out of darkness, out of sadness, and, uh, and out of gladness, I would say is, is the, the mixtures of my, life, of my life. It's just evolved around about these things. I told you how letters came from Australia, and then eventually I was on my way to 
Australia. The first year that I was here, I just simply couldn't fit into family life as such. I just couldn't do it. And uh, I finished my high school, I think, for, the, for, for going towards my high school, or Form 10, they used to call it then. And uh, I was reasonably bright, so I just escaped through school. And, uh, and then I found that I just can't live with my mother anymore. And I made my way to Sydney, where I ended up in the eastern suburbs here. And I moved into um, the first place I stayed was on Mount Street, the top end of Mount Street. You go down to Coogee. And it was there. I was now about 17, there about 17, 16 and a half, 17 more like. And so soon I made lots of friends and uh, lots of surfing friends. And I found myself mingling with these friends and birds of a feather flock together, lie down with dogs and you get up with fleas. But most of my friends were pretty cool, but the drug scene and the drug world was soon comes with the comes with the the, the, the party really. So my friends would offer me marijuana. I was quite happy to give everything a try. But you know, when they say that marijuana is pretty cool, it just relaxes you and 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 all that sort of stuff, my experience shows that it wasn't the case. While it was while it was mind bending and while it was enjoyable at times, little did I know that I was just destroying myself psychologically. I was just imploding inside. It was ruining my whole psychology, ruining my mind very slowly. So after a while you, you got into LSD, which is a horrific mind bending drug. The high, as they say, the high would last five hours on the really peak of the experience five hours it was an incredible five hours and then you got depressed as you came down off such a high and then you go back to dog smoking or pill popping of other ups and downs and whatever so eventually you know mingled with magic mushrooms i was slowly becoming a bit of a mess and my lifestyle you know was slowly becoming completely warped. And I know there were times that God was trying to reach me and to curtail that sort of lifestyle. I told you about last week, about while I was shaving, I heard a voice in the bathroom saying to me, Seamus, if you keep going, you will die. And, and that caused great concern for me. I sort of put it down initially to, you know, what the drugs were doing then. Maybe I was just hallucinating because I had many hallucinations and I thought it was just one of those. No, there was something different about that voice. There was something different about that voice. And that voice reminded me of the angel's voice when I was a child lifting me very much the same if not the same voice. And then very worried, I was 60 kilos, I was thin as, my skin was yellow with, with all sorts of stuff. And then one day I thought, mm, I've really got to try and do something about this. I can't begin to describe to you what I used to get up to. I just, just simply can't. Um, but I can assure you it was at the lowest end of the lowest end. And so here, I think my heart was trying to reach out. I think something was burning inside me to reach back to God. And so I went to a Hare Krishna meeting one night. I thought in my, in my desire to reach some sort of hope for my life. And we ended up in a Hare Krishna little place on King's Cross. And then as I was trying to seek mystic Indian style, new age answers for my condition, the guy just opened the Bible and he read from the scriptures and about the inner light and how 
the apostles had this inner light and the light fell upon them in the day of Pentecost. And I thought, gee, I didn't realize that these Hare Krishna people were Christians. And then they fed me this wonderful meal and all I could take away from that um, vegetarian meal is that um, Hare Krishna is a, a Christian as well. So I got a bit confused about this. And they invited me back for many more meetings. But during that time, someone, as I said last week, a doctor, Gerald Clark, began, he was a, 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 you know, a sort of an engineer, professor of engineering, but he was working at the hospital at the time. And he started to introduce me to literature. And I began to read this literature. Now, last week, this is where uh, the last time we spoke a few a month, six weeks ago, is that the spiritual battle that took place when I was reading this literature in my house full of mates. There was about six of us living there. Every room had their own music system and I had the biggest room in the house and mine was the same, just rock music, African music, the whole lot, while we're stoned out of our heads. And then I realized that I've, I've got to stop. I heard the voice say, you've got to change your ways, Jim. You, you just got to stop. So in the middle of my lounge room floor, there was this Fijian type of big square mat. And I knelt down. I thought, what am I doing here? You know, I'm kneeling down. I thought, well, I've got to do something. So I knelt down and, and I remember this text. Of all the texts that I would remember, and I remembered it because I read it in the book, Robinson Crusoe. Call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you. And I fell down and I said, Lord, deliver me. And brothers and sisters and YouTubers and the lovely lady in Alaska, whoever's listening, it was a day of trouble. And there was one person there also who did not want to let me go. For at least four to five hours, I was tossed about the room like a rag doll. I was stood on. I was kicked. I began to scream. None of my friends were home at the time. They were all out of work or surfing. And I was battered physically, you know, people jumping on me and I thought I'm not going to survive this uh, is this what you get when you call upon the Lord but what I discovered later it was that I had that many demons inside me that's I I was flooded with them I did not realize that I had allowed by my lifestyle by my drug taking, by my actions in life, my violence and all this sort of stuff, that I just allowed them in and they wrecked me. But when I did call upon the name of the Lord, hallelujah, that those demons, every one of them put up a struggle before they finally, all, all of them left. And I, I just collapsed to the ground when my friends came in, they were shouting, are you there, Seamus, are you there? And um, I said, I'm here, but I can't get off the ground. And they thought, oh, he's been taking too much stuff again. So he, they walked over and I said, just pick me up. I can't get off the ground. Something's holding me down. And then one of them just grabbed my arm and pulled me up. And it was that moment I realized that Christ had delivered me. That Christ had taken a wretch like me and delivered me. Delivered me by his power from darkness that I was in. Sadness that I was in. And I could say madness also as well. And I thought, wow. I found my way up to the Stanmore Seventh-day Adventist Church in number one Cannon Street, Stanmore. After rejecting daily invitations by Dr. Clark to come to the Stanmore Seventh-day Adventist Church. 
after that experience, I decided to, to, to come. And I went there one Wednesday evening. I had long hair down to my hips. I uh, had one tooth missing in the front. Uh, I was still sallow, yellow. You know, obviously my kidneys and stuff were gone. And, um, and everybody was kneeling down. And they didn't see me come in. So I thought, that's great. These people must be like Catholic as well because they're all kneeling. And I thought, that's what I used to do. Just come into the church, you kneel down, and that's cool. And then I can slip out. But as I kneeled down, I heard these people praying. And it did something to me. I thought, these people, they're praying for other people. And then one of them said, and we also pray for that young man who's just come in. And the moment they said that, I felt two arms go around me in the Stanmore Seventh-day Adventist Church, just around me. It was more than a presence. It was just that close. And the moment those arms went around me, I could sense them around me, I said these words. Lord, is this the true church? Is this Bethel? Is this the gate of heaven? And a voice said, yes, this is Bethel, the gate of heaven. And that's when I knew that God had led me to the Seventh-day Adventist church. The weeks that followed, my friends gave me such a hard time. I told them that, that the experience that I had at the church and how I felt the warmth of God, you know? And they were really concerned for me, and they genuinely were concerned. They thought my head had finally flipped. In those days, we had a saying that if you took too many drugs, you would go so far out that you couldn't come back. And I'd met friends of mine who had gone so far out that they're still in another place to this day, mentally. They've never been the same since. So I decided that to escape the laughter and the jokes of all my friends who were genuinely concerned, offering me free drugs by the bucket loads, really, by the bucket loads to get my head right again. And I said, I don't need that. I, I, need, a, I need a break. So I decided to move to a place called Randwick, which is not far from Coogee and the main street. I found a boarding house, very small rooms. But there was friends of mine who were determined to rescue me from this fanatical religion that I got involved with. And I was struggling to overcome cigarettes, um, to overcome, you know, marijuana. So I was struggling and I, and I felt that I needed a time to recover. So one night I was praying and all of a sudden I sensed that I needed to really pray because the day before one of my friends said, Seamus, we're going to go out to an amazing party, you know, on Friday night. And we want you to come. We, we really feel you need to get away from this religion and we need you to find peace again with us. And it, it was like, five or six of them and, and the influence was so great my heart began to sort of feel that may oh maybe it is all all in my head and and that sort of thing so i suggest okay just come around and get me and so i was getting ready to go out with them and uh, all of a sudden i was having second thoughts and i said lord this is real struggle for me now i know that You've done wonderful things for me lately. So how am I going to sort this out? And the moment I said that, I fell into a deep sleep. It's deeper than deep. It was total darkness. I was not conscious of the earth anymore or the room I was in. And then I was being escorted by an angel down a pathway in a graveyard very somber music, very somber, just brilliant somberness that touched every fiber of my being. And I knew that this was not a good old man. And as I walked down, 
I saw flowers, roses, red roses, just in slow motion, go past me, in front of me, and all of these roses were landing in an empty grave about 15 feet away by now. And this angel just kept moving me towards this grave. And I thought, oh no. And I said, I said, I said, no, please, please, please don't take me any further. I don't want to see who's in the grave. Please, please. And then a voice said, this will be your fate. If you reject the light that God has so graciously given you, this will happen. And I called in that vision upon the name of the Lord. And he heard me. When I came out of this dream, I just began to weep uncontrollably because I wasn't sure if this event was going to take place, even though I had an option. So my friends just rocked in and I heard them in the room and they were boisterous. And I hid under my bed and they banged on my door and they said, Seamus, we know you're in there. We know you're in there. Come, come, come out to enjoy. Come out to the parties. Come on. Yeah, come on. Bang, bang. And they were really thumping my door. And I thought the effect of that dream, just re I realized that I would be on my way to that grave if I left. And so they gave up and then they went. And I thought, oh, I just got back up and I said, Lord, thank you. Thank you for that. The next day, after enduring such a strong temptation to go back into the world, I, I got news from a friend who wanted to see me. So I went down to a cafe in Ramwick and he told me, oh, I've got some bad news for you, uh, Seamus. And I said, well, what's, what's, is everything all right? He said, yeah, you know, fair go and, um, you know, and, um, and all my, you know, all my mutual friends named them all. They had a head-on car crash last night. I said, really? Yeah, he said, Fergo died. He's dead. And he died. He had the less injuries and, and he died. And then all the others are cripples or broken backs and, you know, vegetables now. And one of them I, I had kept in touch for a long time. And he dragged one of his legs. And then I realized that if I had not obeyed the vision, if I had not taken the warning, I would have been in that that car that night and I would have lost my opportunity. So that sobered me very greatly. And of course I mourned for for, for Fergo and my friends. And I didn't go to the funeral because because it was just too much for me. But I sent my my condolences and everything. And so that made a determination that I would take my faith seriously, take my faith seriously. And so I continually read the scriptures, continually did some studies with Pastor David Down, uh, that's going back a few years now. And then I also continually went to church and, and happily by the time I, I was about 20, I think it was, 20 years old, I was baptized into the Adventist church. Um, and I, I don't think I could express the joy that I finally made a commitment to Christ. I finally came from darkness and sadness and into a great gladness and then into light. And, and really, I didn't become an angel overnight. It, it, it took great prayer for me to continually resist the longings to, to go back and, and to resist the longings to rejoin the Catholic Church. I had to resist many things and eventually Christ set me free. So I guess it's probably good that, that sort of I end there. And, but 
thinking about the sermon last night, I, want, I wanted to add an application. And the application is this, is that God is very merciful to us. And he's very kind. And if, if I'm an example of how merciful God is, I'm sure that God is merciful to every one of us the same way. There, there is no respecter in God's eyes. We're equal in, in the eyes of God. But so if I've been made an example to others, I thank God for that. And I must not be quiet about my witness. I must not lose that passion to continually thank God for rescuing me. And that may then give hope to many people who hear and to many people who have heard that God's extraordinary kindness to me was mainly based on the darkness that I guess I was in and then I went into. And still, he paid no attention to it. He just came and sought me and he rescued me. He rescued me in my filth and he washed me in his blood. And so nothing in my hand can I bring to God even now except except I cling to him. And, and that's what I do nowadays. I still feel my weaknesses. I still have my troubles. But how can I neglect such a great salvation? I'm so glad that I have salvation, that I have a hope, and my life is meaningful. And so I ask you that you will keep me in your prayers, as I will keep you in my prayers today, that somehow a miracle may happen to, to someone in this audience today, or someone that may see it later on, is my prayer. You know, I cannot begin to praise God enough, but I am comforted by the fact that one day I will have eternity to praise him for his great, majestic, awful, wonderful love. May God bless the will our seven days in this church and all its listeners today is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Jim. Would you like to say benediction, please? Absolutely. Thank you very much, Heavenly Father, for your wonderful love to all of us. We know that every one of the members who comes to Willow and everyone who's been a member here, especially the younger people who come as well, that, that I may unashamedly proclaim Christ as the difference maker in my life. And, uh, and how wonderful he has been as a friend and kindness. And even through all the ups and downs, that he is still with us and he promises that he'd never leave us nor forsake us and i believe this i believe this for the young people one thing i do believe is that i have seen the miracle of the u-turn with one minute we're heading for hell happy and joyous with great laughter and the next minute we're heading for heaven and that's the miracle of grace when we least expected we were elected and we thank you, Heavenly Father, for that. So bless the pastor of our church here. Give him the strength he needs to continue in his warfare against the invisible world and that many souls may be saved. We thank you for Lewis's uh, testimony. It just warmed my heart so much to hear her. And I pray that you will continually bless her with a braveness of continually seeking to save that which was lost. So, Lord, a special blessing on the children, special blessing on the young people, and all those who are battle-weary, that we may not fail, but just hang in there till that glorious day when you will arrive with joyful, joyful songs in our hearts and in your heart. In Jesus' name, amen.